So I'm just starting this my next video and it's 9.55 a.m. on the 25th of October 2020. So we're going back in time to the end of 1995, <clears throat> around the month of December. And the person that you're seeing on the screen is a famous comedy actor and his name was Arthur Mullard. So I met Arthur in 1987 when I was 22 years old and it was way before I got first got published and he was a personal friend of mine. I used to live in Islington at the time and and on the day that he died, which was December the 10th, um, the next day the newspaper, every paper was filled with his obituary and the way that the press treated his death was the biggest wake up call I've ever had in my life and I knew I was going to be leaving this profession. So one of the things I wasn't prepared for when I took on my dream to be a magazine writer was to stand up for a friend of mine after he died. When he died, I had known Arthur about eight to nine years and I never knew him in a work sense because we met before I got published and he was winding down at the end of his career and he, he, he taught me an awful lot of things. But whilst he was a very good friend and mentor of mine, we never worked together. Obviously, when I met him, on the day I met him, I recognised him because he's, he was so famous on TV when I was growing up. And, but I think his career peaked around the 70s and then he kind of disappeared. And so when I first met him, I recognised him, but I didn't know where I recognised him from. And it wasn't unusual for me at that time to bump into a lot of famous people for some odd reason. It was maybe the area that I lived in or because I was going to college to do journalism and I was learning how to interview. I don't know. I, I, me and bumping into famous people wasn't an unusual event. But the friendship, the friendship that struck up after I met Arthur was really, it was quite, quite an unusual thing for me. All I remember, it was an April morning and life wasn't going that well for me. I wasn't getting any work. I was temping as a secretary at the time and there was no gigs. And so I took a walk in the park and I remember feeling pretty depressed and he was walking past and I thought, oh, he looks familiar. And I smiled and he spoke to me and we started chatting. And he was asking me where I was from and, you know, I'm from Scotland and I was training, I was going to college and I can't remember what we first said, but after about an hour of chatting with him, he said, well, you know, I've been invited to do this gig tonight and I wasn't going to go, but if you, if you come along, I'll go. And I said, okay, <laughs> I had to say, okay, I mean, there's nothing else happening in my life at the time. And so I remember gathering together my best outfit and off we went to the Islington Boys Club and it was a horse racing event. It was a horse racing thing and it was a dinner. It was a five course dinner. And so I, because I was an extra and they weren't planning on me, I was, they put up an extra plate at the end of the table and I sat next to Arthur and he was sitting next to uh, Raymond Baxter and next to Raymond Baxter, there was uh, Frankie Howard and then next to Frankie Howard there was someone else and I can't remember who that was and then there was one more person but I, I remember speaking to Raymond Baxter and he was asking me what I did for a living and I remember saying I was a trainee journalist and I, I, I just sat there feeling like the biggest fraud because I hadn't got published I wasn't a journalist at that time I was an unemployed trainee journalist if I'm accurate but I remember sitting there and my spirits and my mental state was just sinking through the floor. <clears throat> and Arthur was just looking at me and watching this happening. And eventually he just said, after he finished eating, he kind of sat back and he said, he says, I know you think you're having it hard right now. He said, but you know what happened to me was when I, just as I was becoming famous, my wife got very sick and she committed suicide. And he says, you think you're, you've got a tragic life right now? He says, you have no idea. He said, everything's going to happen in your life and everything's going to be okay. And, and after that, we went home and we, I got home to Islington and we started drinking and talking about things. 
and he he kind of started lecturing me and helped me kind of set aside some of this depression and anxiety and he kept looking at me and he said look he said people are like water eventually everybody finds their own level and he kept on saying it over and over again until I started to relax. I think it was about three in the morning and we were drinking alcohol. I don't know what it was, but we were drinking. Anyway, so I just looked at him and I said, I just let go of the anxiety and relaxed. And he looked at me and he went, that's it. Cheers, you know. And you'll find your own level. I never, ever, ever forgot that. And that was the start of a friendship. And then I left obviously in the middle of the night, quite drunk. And he said, come round tomorrow and I'll show you the pubs of Canonbury. Now, Canonbury, Islington is one of the most beautiful parts of London. And so I did. I hung out with Arthur and he showed me all the most beautiful pubs of Islington. So what stood out to me the most was that he didn't have a lot of schooling. He was almost illiterate when people stopped him in the street to get his autograph, he spelt out his name in capital letters very slowly, almost like a child. But yet, he was a columnist in the local Islington newspapers and magazines, and he actually wrote his own autobiography. So that's a pretty massive achievement for someone who left school at the age of 11. Four months after he died, in April 1996, there was a big news splash about Arthur um, having committed child abuse. I knew it wasn't true, and I knew exactly what it was the minute I saw it, but it was such a huge deal. So I went straight into professionalism mode, and I photocopied some of the articles, and I faxed them to his son, Johnny, who is a successful, at the time he was a successful comedian in Australia, and I said, Johnny, I'm sorry about this, but you need to see this. You need to know about this. And I said, would you be willing to do an interview? And he said, yes. So I just, I was just high, you know, on adrenaline and, you know, stress. And I went into journalism mode and I interviewed Johnny and did a full uh, interview with him. And, you know, my boss was helping me. I was at the agency and, I, and you know, everything I did for the agency you know, they, they were there to help me. And I said, you know, let's, let's get this published. Let's do a, uh, the other side of the story. Let's tell the truth. And so with the help of my boss, I, um, I placed the story with, with the mirror newspaper. And the phone call came in really quick. And I remember the guy's name was Tim. And he said, we would like this, but we would like the exclusive version of this, which means you cannot publish the interview anywhere else. Like, Because it was a, basically an interview with Johnny. The, the story, the allegations that came out were all based around Arthur's daughter, Barbara Lucas. And I, know, I knew personally that Arthur had had a falling out with his daughter, because I, I knew everything. And, but I thought, okay, I'll just be professional. I'm going to take what I know and leave it to the side and I'll just get into professionalism mode. And so Johnny gave me his reaction. I did the interview. We placed it in the mirror and I thought, okay, all was well. We're going to, we're going to take off this image. We're going to balance out this image of what looked like a smear job post death. I mean, but I really thought, I thought, okay, well, I've done this interview with his son and the truth will be balanced and the public will know and people will be able to make up their own minds. Well, that's not what happened. The actual story that I did, the interview that I did, never saw the light of day and my boss said, yeah, sometimes that happens. They will purchase information to bury it. And I remember feeling pretty devastated by this. And it was a lot of money at the time when we placed the story. I mean, obviously, when all of this was going on, I was working for the agency, so I made no financial benefit at all. 
you know, I was an employee. I just got paid a daily rate, like all the other reporters and people who worked there. But for that one day's work, I and that was going back to 95, 25 years. I think it was somewhere in the region of a thousand pounds that I sold the story for, that went straight to the agency and then went straight into the trash can because that article never saw the light of day. In, f in fact, after they saw, after I placed the article with the mirror, they kept on running and rerunning Barbara's interview, which is full of salacious, seedy um, stories about Arthur and how he was supposedly abused her, and nothing about what his son said. Retracting all of that, he, you know, if there had been a headline for the interview I did with his son, the son would have uh, Johnny said, "This is the first I've ever heard of it." But there was one tiny little sidebar attached to all the seedy stuff they put, and it was called, "This is not your life." That was in the, that was the headline of the article, and I'll just read it for you. It says, "Eamon Andrews pulled the plug on This Is Your Life show devoted to Arthur Mallard." after researchers contacted the star's eldest son, Brian, and he explained why he wouldn't co cooperate. Brian had left home years earlier after a massive row with his father. Now, what happened was after Arthur's wife died, Brian left. So that's a whole other story I could get into, but I'm not going to get into that right now. I'm going to stick to this news article. So to continue with this sidebar that the Mirror had written, I put, I quote, but Mullard's other son, Johnny, now a successful comedian in Sydney, Australia, says he was shocked when his sister Barbara told him after their father's death how he had been abused by the man he had doted on all his life, end quote. Now, just to give you an accurate uh, recording of events, they've made it sound like Barbara spoke to Johnny about the abuse. No, it's not true. Barbara and Johnny hadn't spoken for decades. The first Johnny heard about the abuse was when I faxed him the article. And they were not on speaking terms. And they hadn't been on speaking terms because he had moved abroad with his family. And they were they just drifted apart. And so there was uh, Barbara had never, ever, ever had a conversation with Johnny. Barbara, Johnny had a conversation with me, a journalist, who wanted to interview him. And so I'll continue on this Mirror article. Quote, This is Barbara's way of getting back at my father because I don't believe a family should wash its dirty linen in public, said Johnny. Quote, I know he had a bust up with Barbara a couple of years before he died. I remember him saying that if, if everyone was worrying about his money, he would leave it to charity. End quote. So at the time, I, I was, I was learning the ropes. This was all new to me. I was so shocked and upset by all of these allegations. There's just no way I could ever put myself in the media and at that time and say what I knew about Arthur. It just didn't even cross my mind. It just didn't even occur to me that I should do that. I worked very hard on Johnny's interview, and they buried it. So. Pretty, I was pretty certain that if I spoke up about what I knew, they would they would bury that as well. So I know that I know that Arthur did change his will, and I know the day that he did it because he talked to me about it, and he talked to me about the fight he'd had with had with Barbara. Now, I also knew that he really loved Barbara, and he was very very proud of her work as an artist. In the autobiography that he wrote, he included the portrait, which was a painting that Barbara did of him. And Johnny mentioned that in the article. And he says, if, if you had been abused by someone, you wouldn't be able to paint such a loving painting. And he said that that was a painting of joy. And he said, you, you wouldn't be able to do that if somebody had really badly hurt you and destroyed your spirit. And if all the things that Barbara had said was true, she wouldn't have been able to do that. And Johnny was very kind in that he mailed me some family photographs and other pieces of information from Australia to London. And I'm including these in this video. And this is the first time anybody in the public space has ever seen this information. 
And indeed, the story about Arthur's wife was tragic. It was extremely sad. He talked a lot about it in his book and how he got through with his family and how, you know, how Barbara became an artist and how he was very proud of her work as an artist. And some of Barbara's children went to drama school and how he supported that. And so he told me about his wife on the first day I met him. And after that, we never really spoke about it very much. He just told me the story once. He didn't want to delve into it, and I didn't want to delve into it. It wasn't to the day of his funeral when I met all his other friends, because it was interesting. He There was a service at the Actors' Church in Covent Garden, and then there was a trip up to a cremation funeral home up in North London, and then afterwards we all went to the pub, and I met a few people that knew him. And... He, uh, this guy said to me that Arthur had a girlfriend in publishing and he was talking all about this particular girlfriend he had and it wasn't it wasn't long into the conversation I realised he was talking about me and um, Arthur and I were never ever romantic but our relationship wasn't ordinary it was kind of interesting he changed my life and he taught me a great deal. He was a teacher, a mentor, maybe even a guardian angel, who knows. But he... What happened was this guy, and I can't remember his name, I'll remember his looks, he had dark hair, and he was with his wife, and they both knew Arthur. I think they were something to do with a drama school. And he said to me, I says, well, I says, well what else did you know about this girlfriend he had in publishing? I was curious because of the amount of genuine respect and love that he had for this supposed girlfriend he had. Part of me thought, well, he must be talking about me. And I said to the guy, well, what else did he tell you about this woman? And he, he, he just says, he says, oh, I don't know. All he said was she was a loser with men. And at that, I remember we were standing up at the bar, and at that point, the room went silent, and everybody turned around and looked at me. I was standing there pretty shocked, and it was like the words were echoing through the pub, you know, she's a loser with men. And I thought, yeah, he's talking about me. So after I was receiving that massive bombshell, personal bombshell, which was true, by the way. I was close enough to Arthur in the time before he died to know that there wasn't another woman in his life because we spent Christmases together and he trusted me with everything in his life just as I trusted him. And whilst that was not the best label in the world that I've been labelled as, I mean, I've been called many things in my life and that wasn't the most enjoyable, it didn't really bother me that much. I was surprised at how strong I was feeling on the inside. I mean, yes, I was upset about Arthur's death and the events surrounding it, but spiritually, internally, like a veil had been lifted from my eyes and I felt powerful. I felt that I could see everything clearly for the first time. From the moment he died up until the story came out about Barbara and how I was treated when I tried to stand up for him. The whole the whole time period from December through April 1996, I made the decision that I couldn't stay inside this profession, you know, and it was quite dramatic for me at the time because it's worked so hard to get there. And all of a sudden I'm walking away and saying, I, I, this is not for me, I'm not happy, I'm not paying my bills, I'm struggling. And whilst my bylines and my, my name is getting painted across the mainstream media internally, it just it wasn't doing it for me. And that was it. I threw in the towel, I quit, I handed in my notice at the end of April and by the end of May I left. <laughs>